devotees who are joining, please give us a few minutes. Our team is fixing it up and it should go live in a short span of time. It looks like it's already live now. We'll publish that link again on the WhatsApp, uh, in the Zoom chat for everyone. Okay. And uh, on a personal note, as far as possible, I would request the devotees on Zoom to put on their cameras so we can see their moon-like faces. <laughs> it, it will be more personal. So I will begin by singing the Mangala Charna prayers and leading a short kirtan. And then we will discuss our favorite topic, Srila Prabhupada.
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Prem se kaho si Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Kadadhar Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai. Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gopa Gopina Sham Kunda Radha Kunda Giri Govardhan Ki Jai. Vrindavan Dham Ki Jai, Navadrip Dham Ki Jai, Jamuna Mai Ki Jai, Ganga Mai Ki Jai, Tulsi Devi Ki Jai, Bhakti Devi ki jai, yes. Samveta Bhakta Vrinda ki jai, yes. Nitai Gaur Premanande Hari Hari. Yes. All glories to the assembled devotees. Yes. All glories to the assembled devotees. Yes. All glories to the assembled devotees. Yes. All glories, all glories to Sri Guru and Sri Gauranga. Yes. Glories to Srila Prabhupada. So, my dear devotees, I will speak about um, meeting my perfect master. In my youth, I aspired to attain perfect happiness. And soon I realized that such happiness could not be achieved materially, but only spiritually. And through reading spiritual books, I came to understand that to achieve spiritual perfection, I needed a guru. In fact, I read that I didn't even have to choose the guru. He was already there. All I had to do was find him. So whenever I heard about a guru anywhere, even a thousand miles away, I would go to meet him. One teacher I met was a Zen master, supposedly enlightened and certified by another enlightened master in Japan. I had read a book he had written, and when I heard he was holding a three-day 
retreat at his ashram in Rochester, New York, I went. Upon my arrival, I found that his students were not very happy. But I thought, anyway, they're just students. Let me meet the master. During the retreat, he held meditation sessions in which everyone had to sit up straight and look at the wall, concentrating on some object he would give us. The master walked around with a stick and if he thought any of us was falling asleep or that someone's mind was wandering, he would hit the offender. After one such session, some of his students asked him about his recently having become angry. Yes, it's true, he said. I lost my temper. I shouldn't have. I started to doubt whether he was my guru. Still, I had read that a Zen master might appear ordinary and that one might not recognize him. So I thought maybe this is part of it, but my doubt remained. Later, he came to Boston near Brandeis University where I was studying. After his talk and demonstration, someone in the audience asked him about Vedanta. I have enough trouble keeping up with Zen, he answered. How do you expect me to know about Vedanta? My previous doubt was confirmed. He is not my perfect master. Then a Hatha yogi came to Brandeis to give a lecture. He had long hair and a beard and flowing robes. He said that by yoga, <laughs> you could attain complete mastery over your bodily functions, including the movements of the bowels. You could actually command your intestines, ascending colon advance. Mm -hmm. Transverse colon advance, descending colon advance, and finally rectum pass. I was really looking for a guru, so I thought, anyway, maybe. After the lecture, I tried to meet the Swami, but he was leaving for the airport. I wanted to ride with him in his car, but there was no room. So I rode with some of his students. On the way, they discussed the various foods they missed since they had joined the ashram. So I started to have some doubts. But then, he, but then I thought, anyway, they're just the students. The master may be on a much higher level. When we arrived at the airport, I beheld the Swami. There he was long flowing hair, beard, draping orange robes, a flower in his hair, a twinkle in his eyes, the very picture of Indian spirituality. But then I saw him tightly embracing his women disciples. And I knew he is not my perfect master. I have to keep looking. Next, I heard of a, quote, enlightened, end quote, psychology professor who was teaching at Antioch College in Ohio, which was known as a progressive university. And I wanted to meet him immediately. Ready to do anything to find my guru, I got in my car and drove the 700 miles. When I arrived, with great anticipation and eagerness, I searched out the professor's office and inquired about him from his secretary. He's playing golf, she informed me. Playing golf, I asked incredulously. I thought he was supposed to be enlightened. That is his Zen, she replied. Oh no, I thought playing golf, he's not my perfect master. 
Although I was disappointed about the professor, the Antioch campus was full of people interested in spiritual life. And while I was there, I spoke with some of them. Some students in the student union told me about a guru who had recently visited the campus. The guru is in the heart, he had said, where he sits on a lotus flower. You can actually see him and speak with him. Wow, I thought, that sounds attractive. That night, I tried to really focus on my heart. And indeed, I got a definite impression that there was a divine personality there with whom I could have a sublime personal relationship. And he seemed just about to speak. I was very excited and I became eager to meet him. Back at Brandeis, one of my psychology professors invited J. Krishnamurti to speak. I attended the lecture, and during the break, I told my professor that I wanted to meet Krishnamurti. Why, my professor asked. I may want him as my guru, I replied. Oh, he doesn't accept disciples, my professor said. He doesn't even touch money. My professor was impressed, but I wasn't. I thought, if he's actually able to help people, why should he refuse just to be renounced? He is not my perfect master. I kept searching. I already had the idea that you don't have to choose your guru, that he is already there. I even had a mental picture of what he looked like, and he didn't have hair. All the swamis and yogis I had encountered had long hair and beards. So I was starting to despair. How am I ever going to meet my guru? Then one day I saw a poster on campus, lecture, Bhagavad Gita as it is, Swami Bhaktivedanta. My friends and I were supposed to go to the movies that night, but I wanted to attend the lecture instead. When I suggested that, however, one friend in particular got really upset. Why can't you be normal like other people, she complained. All you want to do is see swamis and yogis. And the argument became so intense that I decided not to go. I didn't want to disappoint my friends, so I tried to go along with their idea. But something inside me was impelling me to go to the lecture. Finally, I said, okay, let's go to a later show. But first I have to go to the lecture by the Swami. I promise he will be the last one I go to see. <laughs> My friends reluctantly came along, but because we had been arguing, we arrived at the auditorium late and missed the lecture. Entering the auditorium, I beheld an elderly Indian gentleman sitting on a cushion on stage. Swami Bhaktivedanta. To the side, a young devotee, Satsvarupa Das, sang into a microphone, and other devotees were dancing in a circle around the guru. Satsvarupa was singing right into the microphone, and the sound was reverberating off the bare brick walls. One by one, Students from the audience jumped onto the stage and joined in. I also felt like going up, but I knew my friends wouldn't approve. That would have been too much for them. More students were jumping up, climbing on the stage and joining the circle, dancing. I kept trying to focus my eyes on the Swami, but I couldn't. His effulgence was too great. When the kirtan ended, one of the devotees announced that they needed a lift to Harvard Square in Boston, 
or to Boston. As my friends and I were still going to the movie and it was at Harvard Square, I invited the devotees to ride with us and everyone piled into my station wagon. I was the driver and also in front were two ladies. In the back seat were three or four devotees and in the rear compartment were my friends and I don't even know how many more. I don't think we could have fit anyone else. Satsvarupa was squeezed in the rear with my best friend, Gary. Because of our impersonal readings, my friend was saying that ultimately everything was void. And Satsvarupa was saying, there is no void in the creation of God. But my friend kept insisting, everything is ultimately void. I was overhearing them from the front. And puffed up as I was, I thought, oh, how silly that they are arguing over this. I thought I had it all figured out. So I turned to the back and announced something I had read in some Zen book. It is not void, and it is not not void. But to give it a name, we call it the void. I thought I had resolved the controversy, but still they kept arguing. One of the ladies up front with me was Janaba. I've been trying to understand all the different paths and philosophies, so I asked her about Zen. This world seems real, she said, but it is illusory, like images on a movie screen. Now, if you withdraw your consciousness from the screen, you will find that there is a beam of light. I thought, this is the best explanation I've ever heard, even better than the Zen books. And if you keep following that beam of light back, she continued, you come to a point. I thought, wow, this is getting to the void. But then she said, but behind that point, there is a projector. And behind the projector, there is a person. Then I thought, this philosophy encompasses everything that Zen does and more. Then I asked her about Yogananda. She dismissed him out of hand. Oh, he's just a shopkeeper. Whatever you want, he keeps in stock. You want yoga, he will give you that. Whatever you ask for, he pulls off the shelf. Then she said, at his ashram in California, he has a Gandhi peace memorial. But Gandhi wasn't a worker for world peace. He was a politician who wanted to drive the British out of India. She just dismissed him. He doesn't even know who Gandhi is. She is speaking with authority, I thought. But I sensed that it couldn't all be coming from her. How was it possible for a girl of only 20 or so to have so much knowledge and speak with such authority? But she did have authority. And I knew it wasn't coming from her. Then I thought, this must be coming from her teacher. I want to meet him. When we got to Harvard Square, I let the devotees out. But as I was driving away, I realized I didn't know how to get in touch with them. How would I meet the guru? I immediately stopped the car at the center of Harvard Square, jumped out and ran after them. I caught up to one, Petit Pavan. When he stopped, he turned his head, pointed to the crowd around us and said, you see these people, they're all sleepwalkers. They don't know what they're doing or why. They're just conforming. His words were so intriguing and deep, I wanted to hear more. 
Suddenly, I became aware of the honking of horns all around us. I left my car in the middle of the roundabout, and the traffic at Harvard Square was backed up. The honking kept getting louder. I want to meet the Swami, I said. Quick, give me the address. Come at seven, he said, tomorrow night. I could hardly wait. The next evening when I arrived, the small storefront temple was packed with young people. Srila Prabhupada was sitting on a cushion at the far end. The walls were decorated with exotic paintings and the aroma of incense filled the air. When he began speaking, I had difficulty understanding what he was saying. He had a thick Bengali accent and the philosophy was new to me. But I did hear him say that out of many thousands of men, one would seek perfection. That's me, I thought. He's talking about me. After the lecture, Srila Prabhupada called for questions. Someone asked, since everything comes from God or Krishna, does Maya also come from Krishna? Prabhupada replied that everything comes from Krishna, just like everything comes from the sun. The cloud also comes from the sun, although it covers our vision of the sun. But the sun is never covered by the cloud. Only our vision is covered. I was burning to ask my question. There are so many swamis and yogis, I began, and each recommends a different process of self-realization. And each says that his is the best. So how do I know which is actually best? Prabhupada responded, what is your goal? Do you want to serve God or do you want to become God? How brilliant, how perfect. I was asking about the means, but to determine the best means, we must first establish the end, the goal. When you seek after God, God, who is situated within your heart, will give you all facility. But if you want to become God, you will be cheated. You are cheating yourself. How can you become God? You are trying to become God? Then how you became a dog? God cannot become a dog. God is always God. The Maya body philosopher says that I am God, but by Maya, I am thinking I am not God. So by meditation, I shall become God. But that means he is under the punishment of Maya? God has come under the influence of Maya? How is that? God is great. If he is under the influence of Maya, then Maya becomes greater than God. So the idea is that as long as we shall continue this hallucination that I am God, there is no question of getting the favor of God. Then you do your own business and try to find yourself whether you are God or something else. As soon as I think I am God, I'm cheating myself. Who will help you? That is going on. Everyone is thinking, I am God. So what are you thinking? You're trying to become God? What is your idea? Are you thinking there is no God? I'm thinking that there is God, I replied. There is God. You are thinking like that? But I knew I couldn't cheat him. So I replied, yes. But I can see that I was trying to become God. So you are trying to become God. That means you are not God. Is it not? How you became not God? God is so great that he never becomes not God. So your conclusion should be that I am not that God who is great. 
I am a different God who becomes sometimes not God. Therefore, you are a different God from that God who is great, is it not? This is a fact. Because you are a part and parcel of God, you are minute God. Therefore, you have the potency of becoming not God. Just like a fire and a spark of the fire. A spark, when it is in the fire, is bright fire. But as soon as it goes out of the fire, it becomes extinguished. But the big fire never becomes extinguished. Similarly, you are not that big fire. You are that small spark. You have fallen down. Therefore, you are not God. Now you have to raise yourself again to the fire and you will again be a blazing spark. So that is the difference. That is stated in the Vedic literature. Every living entity is Brahman, but the Supreme Brahman is Krishna. He never becomes not God. We see in Krishna's life, when he was a child on the lap of his mother, he was God. So many demons were killed. He didn't have to meditate to become God. While he was playing, he was God. And when he was fighting on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, he was God. That is God. Not that sometimes not God, sometimes God. That is not God. God is always God in any circumstance. That is God. As Srila Prabhupada was speaking, I got the clear impression that he knew everything about me, that he was seeing right into me, into Waltham, into my apartment, into my bathroom, right to the wall on which I had pasted a sign I had inscribed in beautiful, ornate lettering, you are God. My search was over. I offered my obeisances. I had found my perfect master. The devotees put their heads on the floor and offered obeisances. I also kept my head on the floor in surrender for a long time. I felt so glad. I'd finally found my perfect master and wanted to surrender fully. At the same time, I also felt ashamed and humiliated. My abominable desire to become God had been exposed. Everyone there knew I had wanted to become God. After some time, I heard sounds indicating that devotees were bringing plates of food, prasad, to their guests. Something inside prompted me to look up. I expected everyone would be glaring at me, but no. People were blissfully taking prasad, and, they saw we, and when they saw me get up, they simply smiled. Moments earlier, when a devotee had offered Prabhupada a large plate of prasad, he had responded, I am not God, I cannot eat so much. The prasad I was given looked just like everything else in the temple, colorful, attractive, and variegated. Because of macrobiotics and other speculations, I never expected a feast. Where to begin? I picked up what must have been a cauliflower pakora, put it in my mouth, bit into it, and felt an explosion of taste. One by one, I sampled the preparations, butter, sweet rice, every taste new, incomparable, I thought everything was perfect, the guru, the prasad, the chanting. I loved the chanting. 
The devotees had a sign with the Hare Krishna mantra written in Indian style lettering. During the kirtan, I was looking at the letters on the sign and they started to move, dissolve, form, and unform themselves. <laughs> These were the signs I had been looking for and everything indicated this was it. From the time Srila Prabhupada answered and I bowed my head, I surrendered. From that first meeting, my whole life's purpose became to bring people to meet Srila Prabhupada. And I was able to do that for many years. But when he passed away, I wondered, what will be my service now? My whole service had been to bring people to Srila Prabhupada. Now I understand that Srila Prabhupada is always present and that by speaking of him, hearing about him, remembering him, and most significantly by studying his books and following his instructions, by practicing and preaching Krishna consciousness, we can experience his presence. So I can continue doing what I was doing when Srila Prabhupada was personally present, introducing souls to him, which is what I feel most natural doing. Because I know that somehow or other, if someone comes in touch with Srila Prabhupada, his life will be successful. So, if there's time, and it won't take very long, I would like to relate one other incident uh, that took place with Srila Prabhupada when I first met him in Boston, which gives some insight into his character and into why I surrendered to him. From the time Srila Prabhupada answered my question and I bowed my head, I surrendered. I came to the temple every night. Srila Prabhupada would speak alternately in the temple and at some university. Since the devotees didn't have a car, they asked me to drive Srila Prabhupada and I agreed. One night we were to go to Harvard Divinity School at the most prestigious university in the United States. When it was time to go, as I stood to leave the room, I realized that all my questions had been answered Still, as we were about to get into the car, one question came to mind. Sitting with Srila Prabhupada in the front seat, I ventured, what is it like to be with Krishna? Inconceivable, he replied. Though afterwards, one devotee said that he had answered, that's confidential. At the hall, Srila Prabhupada took his place and began to speak. And I was beginning to understand a little more of what he was saying. When he asked for questions, many hands shot up. One boy stood and gave a long introduction before finally asking, what can chanting Hare Krishna actually do for people? We should really do something to improve their lives, like the Russian Revolution. Srila Prabhupada replied, you are speaking of the Russian Revolution? Now, after the revolution, are the people in Russia happy? The boy looked down, no. Prabhupada said, then what was the use? And even if things get better for some time, again, they will get worse. 
Another student asked, could you repeat anything? Say, count from one to 10 again and again, and it would have the same effect. Well, Srila Prabhupada said, you can try counting. And when you get tired of counting, you can try chanting. The students laughed. Another student questioned, are you always happy? If I tell you falsely that I am happy, Prabhupada responded, will you believe me? What, the student asked. I said, Srila Prabhupada replied emphatically, if I tell you falsely that I am happy, will you believe me? No, the student answered. Then what is the use of the question? The students were stunned. One after another, without a moment's hesitation, Srila Prabhupada answered every question perfectly. Here were the most brilliant students in the most prestigious university in America, stunned and charmed by Srila Prabhupada. Eventually, Srila Prabhupada stood up and left. In a state of euphoria, I wandered among the students, wanting to hear what they were saying. When suddenly Jadarani came running. So, she said, affectionately imitating Prabhupada's accent, where is the driver? Suddenly, I remembered that I was supposed to drive Srila Prabhupada, and he was waiting. I ran to the car and opened the door. Srila Prabhupada got in the front seat and the devotees got in the back. But by then it was dark and I didn't really know the way. Somehow I had managed to find my way in the daylight, but how to find it now? I had some direction, uh, I had some idea of the direction, so I began. But after some time, the streets began to look less and less familiar. And I started to have a sinking feeling that we were hopelessly lost. I couldn't hide it any longer. I stopped the car, turned around and asked the devotees, does anyone know the way back? Nobody did. Is not the driver supposed to know the way, said Srila Prabhupada. We asked directions and gradually found our way back. As soon as Srila Prabhupada left the car, I jumped out and ran up to him. Srila Prabhupada, I'm sorry I got us lost. With a voice full of love and compassion, he replied, that's all right. From what I had seen at Harvard Divinity School, he could easily have demolished me for my lapse, but he didn't. He wasn't angry. He was kind to me. And I was convinced that I had found my perfect master. Srila Prabhupada Ki Chai. So now if there's time, we can take questions or comments. Uh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much uh, for sharing this memories. Uh, we have heard it, I have read it also, but hearing it from you personally was as if we are kind of reliving those moments. Uh, if I may request you, uh, one of the favorite pastimes that I uh, really love and particularly from your journey from America to India is your halt at Cairo, if I'm correct. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're a brahmachari then, and that's how I relate to that incident where you were so steadfast. You write about it in the book, I Will Build You a Temple, there also in the very first chapter. That Prabhupada said, you know, be Krishna conscious. So you were so determined to be Krishna conscious all through and chant loudly. And then something very phenomenal happened in that place when your plane landed. 
and how enthusiastically you were totally absorbed, totally oblivious of what's happening around uh, in that airport and the country at that point of time. Maybe if you would so like, can you please share that and uh, uh, any, any lessons from that for us? Uh, Brahmachari is to remain absorbed regardless of what's happening outside. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Srila Prabhupada announced that he was going to return to India to try to revive the Krishna consciousness there. And uh, pretty much everyone wanted to join him. Um, and Prabhupada asked that each of the 14 or so temples in America send the best man they could spare, generally the second in command, to join him. And I was chosen to go from Boston. So that October, I was on my way to India. And uh, in, in Brussels, I met three of Prabhupada's earliest and most prominent disciples, Yamuna, Shamsundar, and Shamsundar's wife, Malati, with their two-year-old daughter, Saraswati. Guru Das, Yamuna's husband, whom I had met earlier in Boston, was also with them. He had arranged a cheap flight on a small airline and that evening, 11 of us, without Shamsundar, who stayed behind to escort four more devotees from America the following day, boarded an old converted dual propeller cargo plane bound for Bombay with a stop in Cairo. In my mood of single-minded Krishna consciousness, I was practically oblivious to things around me. I wanted to avoid Maya, anything that could distract me from Krishna, and didn't pay much heed to anything that didn't relate to my service. I was focused on chanting and hearing every word of the Hare Krishna mantra, and on always thinking about Krishna and never forgetting him. I heard that Prabhupada had said that if you had trouble hearing, you should chant loudly. And sometimes to avoid any possible lethargy while chanting, I would jump up and down. There was some anxiety in the group about how people in Egypt might react, but I was fixed. <laughs> There was unrest in Cairo. President Gamal Abdel Nasser had recently died. And when we landed, we were met on the tarmac by soldiers and armed security guards with bandoliers of bullets strapped across their chests and machine guns slung over their shoulders. As we deplaned, they followed us with their machine guns. Stepping down the mobile stairway, Yamuna noticed the guards shifting their aim behind her, the muzzles of their guns pointing up and then down. And when she turned to see what they were aiming at, there I was behind her, jumping up and down as I chanted. On the tarmac, Chidananda set up an altar on a table and we began kirtan. Crowds of onlookers surrounded us and watched us from behind the terminal's windows and balconies, leaning over the railings to smile and wave at us below. I was elated. Not only were we on our way to the holy land of India, but now we were chanting and dancing in exotic Muslim Egypt. And all these people were getting the benefit of hearing the holy names. After leading the kirtan for some time, I addressed the soldiers and other people gathered around us. Then I took two of the soldiers by the hand and pulled them into the kirtan. 
and they sang and danced and laughed in enjoyment. Nanda Kumar had been playing cartels, but feeling anxious about the potential dangers of the situation, he had circled around the plane to chant by himself and pray for protection. When I came back, he later described, the first thing I saw was two machine guns leaning against the bus and Giri Raj holding one guy in each hand. And these Egyptian military guys were jumping up and down <laughs> and chanting Hare Krishna with big grins on their faces. So <laughs> that was special. That was special. Yeah, we, uh, <laughs> I guess you could say we were fearless and we were successful. We wanted, we wanted everyone to, to chant and dance with us, and overall, we were successful. Thank you. Thank you so much, very much, Maharaj. Uh, we have Mother Nandini Radha. She has a hand up. I'll ask her to unmute and she can ask a question. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Hi, Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your lotus feet. So much for for such a wonderful narration. I had a question for you because you use the word perfect spiritual master quite often in your search. So when you encountered Srila Prabhupada, were the very were there any very specific attributes that you were looking for in a spiritual master in terms of those twenty six qualities, or what was your definition of perfection at that time, Maharaj? Oh. Um, well, I didn't know about the 26 qualities of a devotee then, but um, I'm thinking of the title of the book, Perfect Questions, Perfect Answers. He was, he was my perfect master because he answered all of my questions perfectly. And also he... Yeah, everything about Krishna consciousness was perfect. Um, you know, the, 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 the chanting, the, the prasad, the philosophy, the guru, of course. And, um, and it, it was all coming from Srila Prabhupada. So, yeah, he was my perfect master. All the other ones, as I related, had some defect to my mind, uh, but I didn't find any defect in him. So he was my perfect master and still is. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I request Mother Medhavani. She has a question. She can unmute herself. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, so I am so, so grateful to you uh, uh, Maharaj uh, that you kindly uh, accepted our invite and uh, you are here with us. It's a dream come true Maharaj, personally for me and for all of us who joined us in this session. Uh, so Maharaj, uh, I remember I asked you this question uh, earlier on when you gave this, uh, you know, Katha in the Ispon Chennai temple and uh, I am like so blown away by your responses. Uh, uh, how uh, straightforward, how uh, very down to earth you are in your responses. I was like blown by it. So uh, for the uh, benefit of all of our 100 participants on uh, Zoom and uh, I think close to about 100, 200 participants on YouTube, uh, if you can just quickly uh, summarize, uh, Maharaj, what are the qualities in Prabhupada uh, that you found uh, yourself so attracted to that uh, you surrendered your life to Srila Prabhupada? And we have his own as Giriraj Maharaj in Islam because of which so many of us, millions of us are now part of Islam. Could you please share something, Maharaj? Thank you. Yes. Um, well, Srila Prabhupada has so many uh, wonderful qualities. Um, I think 
One is his humility. Um, once he gave a talk in which he was speaking about, you know, the, the, the different categories, like, uh, you know, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Shudra. And someone in the audience sort of uh, challenged him. So what, what are you? I suppose you're the highest. And Srila Prabhupada replied, you know, without any pretense or duplicity, I am the lowest of all. I am the servant of everyone. And yeah, that was his mood, his humility, his compassion, which I touched upon in, in some of what I described. Um, his intelligence. Uh, I think of something he told us. Although just while it came to my mind, once someone asked me the Prabhupada's uh, servant, Shrutakirti Prabhu, what quality of Srila Prabhupada struck him the most. And he replied, Srila Prabhupada's practicality. He was the most practical person that he ever met. And uh, yeah, there were <laughs> so many times when Srila Prabhupada showed his practicality. There was one, one time in Juhu, early in Juhu, um, they needed a string to tie the, uh, the microphone to the tape recorder, to the microphone through which Srila Prabhupada was giving his talk. And they didn't have any string. So Srila Prabhupada said, okay, one of you give your Brahmin thread. So <laughs> to me, that's an example of Srila Prabhupada's practicality. Um, yeah, his, his wisdom, his compassion, uh, his surrender to Krishna, his dependence on Krishna. Um, yeah, this is like a perfect person. Thank you, Maharaj. There is a question on the chat from Mother Alicia from London. And she's asking, Dear Maharaj, you were seeing devotees then, and you see them now. Do you think things have changed? Is there any word of caution for new devotees like us? since you have been through ISKCON from the beginning and through different phases? Um, that's a good question. Uh, because we are concerned, of course, about the future of the movement. And, uh, you know, keeping Srila Prabhupada in the center. And if devotees, well, everything, everything, but specifically I'm thinking if they read Srila Prabhupada's books and apply what they read in their lives, um, you know, they'll be able to continue Krishna consciousness, their own individual Krishna consciousness and the Krishna Consciousness Movement. And also to chant very attentively. On a couple of occasions, Srila Prabhupada was asked, you know, now, now you're here. So if we have any questions, we can ask you, but what about later when you're not here? How will we get the answers to our questions? So that question was presented by 
uh, Satsvarupa Das at the time to Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada replied, the holy name of Krishna is not different from Krishna. It is the same as Krishna. Do you realize this fact? And on other occasions, Srila Prabhupada gave the same kind of answer when asked how we would get answers uh, after he left. So I think that's really important that, that we chant good rounds. Uh, and I think the combination chanting good rounds and studying Srila Prabhupada's books will, uh, will, will keep us. Of course, Srila Prabhupada wanted us to preach and distribute books. He said, um, distributing my books will keep them happy and reading my books will keep them, meaning keep them in Krishna consciousness. So we should, we, we should do both. Then the process is complete. We should uh, taste and distribute. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful answer. Uh, somehow this has become a struggle uh, as the days goes on. Uh, in the beginning, it seems to be very wonderful when things are new. The chanting is new, Srila Prabhupada looks are new. And however, when it goes on after several years, the same thing sometimes becomes difficult. And as you very rightly said, Maharaj, it all begins with attentive chanting. And you know, stick to the process of reading Prabhupada books regularly. Uh, thank you for, uh, you know, re reminding us of the basics, which often at times we forget as we are moving forward in our journey. Well, there's another question from Dr. Sachin Prabhu, and his question is about being accepted from spiritual master. And his question, I'll just read out what he says. The realization of finding Guru and being accepted by Guru at times takes a lot of exams by destiny. How to okay. remain, I mean, it, uh, being accepted by Guru, uh, sometimes it takes a lot of time. Uh, you know, he's writing as a lot of exams by destiny in another sense. Uh, it depends on, you know, we don't know when our Guru will accept us, but we are trying to be steadfast to the process. So how to remain steadfast if in case we are not getting initiated or if Guru is not yet uh, giving initiation and not to get disturbed However, we have surrendered and accepted a particular spiritual master to be our guru in our heart. How would Paramatma help pass our message to the guru to accept me as a disciple? <laughs> okay. Is this Dr. Sachin Kasat? Yes, Maharaj. On the Zoom? Um, so you've selected someone who you want as your guru. And is that person initiating? Dr. Sachin? Sachin, Sachin Prabhu, if you're there, you can just raise your hand and I'll... Where is your hand? Yeah, unmute. Unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, so... Please unmute yourself, Sachin, too, so you can respond to Maharaj. So you selected someone to be your guru. So the person who you selected is the person initiating. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandot Pranam. So basically my query was, you, you find someone as the right guru, like in your case, you gave us this uh, realization and your experience you shared right now. How you, after approaching so many people, you found Prabhupada to be the ideal guru. Now the question also happens after you have found someone as your right guru and you have accepted it in your heart, you want to surrender. At times it also is important that the guru also blesses you simultaneously. Otherwise, you will never progress. That's, that's what we hear. Unless there is a, uh, what I will say, blessings from the devotee and the guru, you cannot progress in bhakti. So at times it takes time. Because the Guru also needs to have confidence on you that yes, you are the perfect surrendered sword and you can take forward his instructions. At that time, 
at times you feel that we get disturbed there are so many people asking us why uh, you are doing these things or that things so how to remain steady and the second question is if you have surrendered some to someone and accepted as a spiritual master in your heart as, especially how does it how is it not possible that the paramatma is able to share this to the spiritual master this realization so that was my humble question prabhu ji ki how does this process happen and how you can get the mercy continuously well if you select as someone to approach to become your spiritual master you should tell him you shouldn't <laughs> wait for the paramatma in your heart to tell the paramatma in his heart you should approach him and um but yeah you may have to be patient that's also one of the requirements as stated by rupa goswami in upadesh amrit utsaha nischaya daryat utsaha means enthusiasm uh, nischaya means confidence and daryat means patience so we need both enthusiasm and patience shila prabhat said that enthusiasm without patience can lead to a desire to control and that patience without enthusiasm can lead to a lethargy so we need uh, to have both you should be enthusiastic definitely uh to to find your guru and to be accepted by your guru but at the same time you also have to be patient thank you much hari krishna thank you. hari krishna maaj maybe we will take this as one of the last questions uh from a young boy whose name is braj mohan prabhu he is a teenager and he is asking a question uh what was the most important instruction of shila prabhupad to you well one that comes to mind uh he gave to me in calcutta uh i i asked him uh you know now now you are here so everything is all right but what if in the future when you're not here is kind of falls from the standard what should i do and shila prabhupad replied you are also one of the important members of the society which i don't think i really was at that time but anyway he said you are also one of the important members of the society so you work for the correction but don't leave and another one which came very close to the end just maybe 3 days before she the prophet left us in vrindavan uh he asked to see me it was like practically the middle of the night he was lying on his bed and he he asked um uh, so after i leave uh do you think this movement will go on and i replied as long as the devotees are sincere and chant their rounds and follow the regulated principles it will go on and shila prabhupad responded uh organization intelligence and organization and from that i understood that yes for our own krishna consciousness uh we have to chant we have to be sincere and chant our 16 rounds and follow the regulated principles but to preach we need organization intelligence and organization so i think those are very important personal instructions 
you know, uh, in addition to the general instructions about the practice of, of bhakti yoga. Um, so, to receive regular updates about Srila Prabhupada's Sparanam Utsav, join this Srila Prabhupada Smaran Utsav WhatsApp group if you have not already joined. And then the link is there. It's in the chat. So please, all of you. And then you can learn more about upcoming programs by Ival Pune here. And then there's a, uh, a, a web address for that. So there's a lot in the chat. <laughs> so my dear devotees, please, please get the information from the chat. And also, um, did you wanna say something about my book? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, if you would like to say something, or else I can just direct them. I just wanted to show them the web link. Just one second, Maharaj. Uh, so, dear devotees, thank you all for joining once again. Uh, this is Maharaj's official website. And if you happen to go there, giridaswami.com, you'll find on the corner here, there are four books which have been published so far. You can either go here or else you can, if you are in India, you can go on Amazon.in and there you can search for Giraj Maharaj. Uh, again, the four books, Many Moves. This is the first book that I read. I don't know chronologically which was published first, but this is the first book I got when I was back there in America. I believe it was published somewhere around 2011 and 12. And this is about the lives of around several devotees who have departed away. Uh, and Maharaj have very beautifully uh, transcribed or written about them, about their journey in Krishna consciousness. And then we have the watering the seed and Maharaj today was sharing from that what Maharaj have written in the book about his journey, about meeting with Srila Prabhupada. And there is another book titled as Life's Final Exam. Uh, it's about preparing death and dying from the Vedic perspective. And one of the recently published book, I Will Build Your Temple, uh, almost 15 years ago, I had read Prabhupada Lilamrit, and of course, for the sake of when we teach, I refer to it. But when I started reading it, it was like after Prabhupada Lilamrit, this was the book which really gave me that that emotional jolt. Uh, you know, really, really, uh, particularly this was all about India, what happened in India. Uh, Prabhupada Lilamrit takes you all over the world what Prabhupada did for this book. And I'm in Pune right now, so Bombay is very close by here. It was a very, very inspiring and encouraging to read. So humble request to all of you. Uh, the whole purpose of organizing this uh, program centered around knowing more about Srila Prabhupada. And as Mara said, made a point that for the future generations, it's very important for all of us to stay connected to Srila Prabhupada, to make Srila Prabhupada as a center of our life. And it's very important, therefore, for us to read about Prabhupada. Uh, interestingly, every Srila Prabhupada disciple have had a personal journey with Prabhupada. Mm. And everyone, so many books have come and every time you read the books, the journey which is written by Prabhupada disciples is phenomenal. It's a different story, different perspective and it just opens up a new chapter in our life about Srila Prabhupada. And so does the wonderful contribution that Maharaj made by taking his precious time spending months and years together to uh, put down this book, I'll build your temple. Please do. Uh, Maharaj, we recently, a uh, year before when we had our marathon here in Pune, so in marathon gifts as part of a gifts to all those uh, who had distributed books, we distributed this book for all the congregation and brahmacharis. Uh, there was a huge number when the books were give, given out. And recently also, uh, you know, the books were given out when His Holiness Bhakti Bharat Bhagavad Swami Maharaj had visited Pune. At that time also Maharaj was encouraging all to read this book. So like that, I have got three copies with me <laughs> in different, different occasions. <laughs> so I'm halfway through 
uh, I'm trying, you know, probably in a, a week or two, I'll finish it. So my request to all of you, please do read it. This was just, you can say what we had today was a prologue. The rest of the contents of the book to be unfolded. When you open a book, I'll build your temple. And a last announcement to all of you. Uh, as I said, this is just kind of a prologue for this Maran Ustav also. What we're going to have next is if you go on evolpreneur.com, there on the homepage, you'll find this link. So this is a schedule for the schedule uh, for the uh, uh, program schedule where next week on Sunday morning, we'll have His Holiness Panu Swami Maharaj. Then we have Nasima Swami Maharaj and all others to follow up. You can check out the list and at the bottom of it, we have kept again an online competition. Somehow people like to take part in competitions. So when there is a hearing going on, so let's evaluate that. So do take part in competition, which is based on English and Hindi language. And the, the content for that uh, quiz is based on Srila Prabhupada Lilamit, first five chapters, and also the lectures, what Maharaj is going to speak from there, selected questions will be posted there. So thank you all. Maharaj, any uh, concluding, uh, any remarks uh, or any concluding direction for us to all of us to become, uh, to follow in your footsteps and become a sincere soldiers in the army of Srila Prabhupada. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, our service contribution may only increase. Any, any concluding remarks on that, Maharaj? Um. Well, I, somehow I think of when Srila Prabhupada was in New York City and he was being interviewed on the radio and the interviewer asked him, do you have any message for the people of New York? And Srila Prabhupada replied, yes, don't live like cats and dogs. <laughs> but of course, there's no need for me to say this to you exalted devotees. Um, yeah, just chant attentively, um, yeah, serve the devotees humbly, uh, study Srila Prabhupada's books, distribute his books, and uh, be happy in Krishna consciousness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for taking out your time and enlivening and enriching our heart with Srila Prabhupada's memories and love. Uh, I'll just conclude with uh, one more little incident where I was humbled, humbled in your association because of my own foolishness. I was a new bhakta and I was asked to serve Maharaj. So I was serving Maharaj, that time dinner when the program had ended, I, I'm telling you, I was new bhakta. And when I was serving a vegetable, uh, there was a vegetable which was being served. So I was serving that to Maharaj and Maharaj looked at me and asked, what is this? And I had no clue what was that vegetable all about. And I very confidently said, Maharaj, this is called vegetable. <laughs> 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 I mean, I wish I had a camera that time. I should have taken a snapshot of Maharaj's look. He gave me such a quizzical look and he looked at me and he said, even I know this is vegetable. What's in it? <laughs> I was, I didn't know what to say because I had no idea. I ran out of the temple hall, went to find out the Mataji who had cooked. Mataji, what is in that vegetable? She was also confused. What is the vegetable and all that? Finally, I got an answer and I gave. So it's always wonderful to get association. If not Wapu, but Wani, Wani is more important. So, so fortunate and blessed today. So we had the opportunity to hear from you, Maharaj. Hope to have your association time and again if you're scheduled from us. Yes. Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So if we're ending now, I suggest we conclude with Vaishnava Pranam. Let us offer our respectful obeisances unto all the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord, who are just like desire trees who can fulfill the desires of everyone and are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. Vanchakalpa trubhyascha kripa sindhu bevacha patita nam pavane bio vaishnave bio namo namaha anantakoti vaishnave rindi ki jai Srila Prabhupada ki jai His Holiness Giraj Maharaj ki jai Hare Krishna Hare Krishna